Uh, so uh, just to introduce ourselves one more time in case it didn't come through clearly, I'm Wynn Brown, uh, interim uh, CEO here. Um, this is actually my second uh, Green Mountain Care Board presentation. So I've been here a little over a year, uh, leading Mount of Scutney. Dr. Ip uh, to my right is our chief medical officer and also leads quality for our organization. Celeste Pitts is the, our interim chief financial officer. She's also the interim chief financial officer for Valley Regional Hospital across the river in Claremont. We're gonna talk a little bit about that uh, coming up in our presentation, which is uh, important to the future of, of both our hospitals. Uh, and Andrew Garamy is, is a face I know that's known to many of you. He's been in many of these, uh, these hearings before and helps in their financial uh, piece. Um, for our uh, agenda today. Uh, we're just going to give you a brief overview of who we are. Um, we're going to talk a lot about quality and access, cost, what our request is, and then talk about our risks and opportunities as we look to our budget for the for the coming year. Um, and um, so we look forward to getting into that with you. So just to um, perhaps uh, refresh everybody's um, understanding of who we are, Mount of Scutney, uh, this is our main campus in Windsor. Uh, we serve Southern Windsor County in Vermont, and also a fair number of our, our patients come from across the river in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, we are less than a mile from the river, uh, and so we are very close by, and we, we'll, I don't know if we'll get into it today or not, but I think you're aware of some of the challenges of border hospitals like ourselves in Southwestern Vermont when you're very close to other states and how that affects your payer mix and your services as well. Um, so we're 25 beds for critical access, so acute and swing beds. We also have a 10-bed uh, distinct unit, one of a handful of distinct 10-bed bed units in the country for inpatient rehab, or one of two inpatient acute rehab uh, facilities in the state, and the only one that is CARP certified, which is a very extensive certification that we go through um, to ensure the quality and service, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in our presentation. Uh, we also have um, Otto Quichi Health Center in Windsor, which is a primary care practice and, and behavioral <coughs> health practice. We have an ophthalmology practice in Hanover, New Hampshire. We're going to talk about ophthalmology later. Uh, and on this campus, we have a, a rather large primary and specialty care practice right here embedded in the hospital. Um, we're, as you may be aware, we're well recognized for our quality, and Dr. Ip will show, share some of our recent recognition that we have and our service levels when you look at our press gainy, um, patient satisfaction, and as well as our staff engagement, we're among some of the highest in the country. Um, our mission is to improve the, the lives of those we serve, and we do that really with a robust array of services that we feel are appropriate for our region. We do not try to be all things to all people. We, we are not large enough to have every single specialty, but luckily in partnership with Dartmouth Health, we have the ability to bring some of their specialists on our campus part-time, uh, to make sure that patients get their care locally. Uh, and we're 30 minutes south of, of uh, Dartmouth uh, Medical Center's uh, primary campus. So we have relatively close access to that as well. So that's helpful to our population. Um, I just wanted to share with you um, the org chart for Dartmouth Health because there is the recent change of Valley Regional Hospital coming in to become a full member of Dartmouth Health a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and what does that mean for us? Well, that means that um, we are going to, we've always had a close collaboration with Valley Regional Hospital. We share a number of staff between our organizations because as a critical access hospital and given our size, you know, we, uh, we need a lab director, but we don't need a full FTE of a lab director. So we share our lab director between the two hospitals. We share respiratory uh, services uh, manager between the two hospitals, a 340B um, specialist we share, as well as emergency preparedness. And we see that there's a number of opportunities in the future now that Valley has come into the system to share even more. One of the things that is underway right now is a search for a CEO to serve both hospitals. Uh, following that will be a search for a chief financial officer for both hospitals. So if you think going forward, the expense of you know, some of those overhead people like myself will be shared uh, and lower the cost of, of um, operating both the hospitals. We haven't gotten deep into what are those next steps because um, as you know, we, you're competitors until you are not. Uh, and now we are members of the same family. And we're gonna begin some of those conversations of where we can collaborate uh, better. So we'll, we can, and Celeste is gonna touch on that a little bit later in the presentation. The other piece that we have that um, is we also own historic homes of Runnymede, which is a 39-bed assisted living 
campus in downtown Windsor, which um, has been a subsidiary of ours for a long time um, that we inherited from a local not-for-profit. Uh, but we have worked very hard this year to bring it in closer to us um, to share our um, HR platform, to employ everybody um, off, and you'll see that in the financials that Andrew will see, to make sure that we maintain access for long-term care. Uh, as you know, uh, access to long-term care in the state of Vermont is, is very difficult. Uh, and so we're, we feel very firmly that we need to make sure that that organization, uh, which serves a, a large number of Medicaid patients, our residents in our region um, that we have act that they have access to that. So we can talk about that more later if you would like. Um, I will also say with Valley Regional Hospital coming in that our boards have mirrored. So the board of as of last week, the the trustees of Mount Escutney Hospital are the same trustees for Valley Regional Hospital. So we will have mirror board meetings. And so those two boards can make decisions for the greater region as to which services should reside where. A perfect example for us historically has been, we do not provide orthopedic surgery on this campus. Now, a lot of hospitals pursue orthopedic surgery because it's profitable, but we have never, we haven't done that for a number of years because Valley provides it across the river. So now that we're together, we would, we would not look to compete on certain service lines when it really only needs to be specialized on a particular campus. Uh, next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ip, who's going to talk a little bit about our, our quality uh, recognition and our quality programs, uh, for which we're widely recognized. Great. Thank you. Um, here at Mount Scutney, we take a lot of pride in our work and quality. And as part of that work, we assess our patient experience scores. Uh, we use Prescani to measure those scores. Um, we highly value the patient experience here as it helps drive quality, patient safety, and outcomes. And, and we've been high performers across various domains and patient experiences as seen here. Um, our healthcare providers perform well above the national average and, and Vermont average in multiple domains, including um, provider communication, medication communication, patient education, and that's all reflected in this slide here. Next slide, please. And as recognition for our quality, um, in 2023, we received the uh, Guardians of Excellence Award from Prescani, and that's awarded to for us scoring a 95th percentile for patient experience. And this this was the second year in a row that we've been awarded this. Uh, we were also awarded by Chartis in 2023 the Performance Leadership Award and that recognizes our performance uh, among rural hospitals in quality outcomes and patient experience. Um, also in 2023, we uh, we were accredited for a level two at geriatric ED. Um, we're one of two hospitals in Vermont who have achieved that level two accreditation in Vermont. And that really you know, demonstrates our commitment to integrating geriatric healthcare um, delivery into our daily operations. Um, in 2024, we received our uh, three year reaccreditation for CARF, and that's for our acute rehab facility. Um, and this accreditation is a, has a particular focus on, on stroke. But that's a very arduous recertification, and we're very proud of that. Um, one of the probably few critical access hospitals in the nation that CARP certified. So, um, next slide, please. Here we have a strong culture of quality and safety throughout the organization. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with getting our staff engaged and committed in quality. Also, as part of the Dartmouth Health System, we participate in the um, patient safety organization and that helps standardize a lot of quality workflows and norms across the health system for all the member sites. Um, we've been, you know, as part of some of our improvement initiatives, um, we've implemented um, controlled substance best practices um, here and across the system. Um, there's ongoing work on things like mortality reduction, hospital readmissions. Um, we partner with other hospitals in these initiatives. So, um, you know, that's part of the work that's ongoing moving forward. Next slide, please. So, rehab is a big part of what we do here in Maniscutney, and we're one of two acute rehabilitation, rehabilitation facilities here in Vermont. And so, for the 
as I spoke about earlier, um, we we accredited our three year uh, certification for CARF for our inpatient acute rehab unit. But for the very first time as well, we received a three year accreditation for our outpatient therapies program. And um, yeah, this reflects a lot of the so the te testament to the hard work of our nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, case workers, our providers um, of really. Um, Performing to the top of their abilities, and you can see that our CMS satisfaction scores really reflect uh, that hard work. Uh, next slide, please. Also, in 2023, we completed a very successful CMS recertification survey um, where there was only one item that we were asked to address, and it was uh, just a verbiage change in one of our policies. Um, there was no other concerns cited on the survey, so we're very proud of that. Part of our success is really the approach that we take here in our organization. We focus on being ready for the next patient, for the next survey. Um, our team takes a lot of pride in this work, making sure that we remain vigilant, um, performing mock surveys throughout the year to stay prepared, um, you know, doing a lot of detailed work and quality metrics. Um, so that, that's just a lot of preparation work. Next slide. And our quality measures are strong across the board, whether it's radiology, laboratory, and the clinical practices. Um, as part of the Dartmouth Health System, we perform well um, within the system um, for our quality metrics, often we're ranking second in the system um, and above 75th percentile in a lot of our metrics. Um, as part of maintaining this strong and consistent performance and quality um, and in our surveys, um, this requires an investment in the, in the team and that's management and data analytics and doing mock audits. Um, and this in turn feeds into high employee engagement, retention and patient, patient satisfaction. Slide please. Turn this back over to Win for access. So access is uh, an issue across uh, Vermont and across really the DH system, ensuring especially around primary care access, uh, is particularly on this campus. So this is just an example of the array of services that we provide, uh, and they're in different colors. So you can see um, which services uh, come from Dartmouth Health, which are jointly with us in Dartmouth Health, and who we employ on our own. So cardiology, gastroenterology, general surgery, uh, neurology, pathology, ophthalmology, which we're going to talk a bit about, which is a very important to us and I think to the state of Vermont uh, as we dramatically grow that program in a long-term specialty of ours. So you can see the array of things that we offer. We're not, as I said, all things to all people, but we have a relatively comprehensive array. Part of the challenge of, of any critical access hospital is that a lot of these benches are not very deep. Uh, so, you know, you may have, we may only have one or half time or part time or uh, provider in this area. And if we lose one uh, and, it, you know, lose that provider to, to moving out of the region, um, it does create a challenge for us. But luckily, we've been able to partner um, in some of these instances with Dartmouth to help fill those holes um, with, through uh, our arrangement of leasing uh, of, of the provider to come to us. Next slide. Um, this is one of the big challenges that we face um, right now. This is our visit lag. So from, from getting an appointment, how long it takes to get an appointment. And you can see uh, that over the past few years that it has gotten harder to get in on a timely basis for us. Um, there have been um, the challenges really largely around primary care. Um, we have lost a number of providers um, or we have providers that are, work, are aging and, and working less hours. Uh, but still practicing. And so we've been working very hard on recruiting those providers as well. Dartmouth actually has uh, set a goal that any patient can get an appointment in any specialty within 14 days. Um, and so that is our target as well. Our tar we are right now, I believe, I think we sit at 44 days uh, to get into an appointment um, on average. Uh, but it's, it's a huge challenge, especially in a rural area. You know, we sit um, on the border of New Hampshire, which um, also makes it a challenge to recruit and retrain, retain people, especially when they can uh, work just across the river and not pay income tax. We run into that actually a great deal. Um, and so they choose not to come practice and be employed by us. Next slide. 
Um, so we are doing a lot of things around that. Um, we are obviously regularly monitoring our the productivity of our providers and we share that information with them. We're very focused on our wait times. Um, we actually have, we are not open right now to new primary care uh, patients. We have a wait list to come in. We expect that wait list to open in September um, as we have a couple of new nurse practitioners coming on board shortly. Uh, we've also um, saw in Dr. Hamery's um, presentation looking at the scheduling of appointments um, and, and, the, and the duration of those. And we've been making adjustments with our providers to open up their schedule with some shorter appointment times uh, to make sure that we can try to get patients in on a timely basis. We've also expanded our walk-in clinic hours uh, to help catch um, some of those patients that, that need to be seen on, a, on an urgent basis but don't need to go to the ER. Uh, and that has been very well received by, by the community. Um, so we are working hard. Our staffing levels and our practices overall right now are, are good when it comes to um, nurses and support staff. Um, but we are challenged by, as you've heard in every presentation, the, the, um, the salary uh, requirements now um, to, to successfully recruit and retain uh, people across the whole health system at every level. Um, and then really working hard on our hours and schedules to make sure that we open up the access as best we can. Next slide, Andrew. Um, this is uh, from Dr. Hamry's presentation about what are the, across the, the state, the high impact actions that, that um, organizations can take. Um, and you can see that we essentially have, have implemented or have been implementing um, all of all the things that he has recommended that we look at as a state. Um, I will say one of the things that we've been working really well with, um, and it's coming, it's been maturing very well at Dartmouth is the transfer center. So we now move patients between um, the, the Dartmouth affiliates much more efficiently and effectively than we used to. So patients that um, are at, at, at Dartmouth Hitchcock, uh, in, in lab who no longer need that level of care, but still need acute care or swing care. We are in regular communication to see who can move here. And likewise, if we have someone who we, that is a, a beyond the, the care abilities of our organization, how do we get them to DH or to UVM uh, for that level of care so that we keep them in the region? And so that has come a long way. Uh, and. Um, more and more things are happening there. So that is a good thing. That also allows Vermont residents to come back into the state of Vermont to be cared for at a lower cost facility and oftentimes closer to their loved ones and their support system. So um, we, see great, we see great progress there. and We're very excited about that in particular. And it's been a great partnership. It's taken, you know, it's taken a couple of years to get there. One of our big challenges, and we'll talk about it when we get to our capital request is that we are on Cerner for our electronic medical record, uh, where the Dartmouth system is on Epic. Uh, and so that creates a lot of friction uh, in moving information back and forth as we try to uh, move patients um, efficiently uh, to the appropriate site of care. Uh, so we'll talk about that a, a little bit later. We also, um, to lower our costs as well, um, buy a lot of services from Dartmouth for our back office, so our human resources uh, for our benefits, uh, for a number of the finance uh, things that we, that we do so that we don't have to try to recruit and retain those people locally. We can, we can, we can buy the piece of service that we need through a PSA with, with Dartmouth. And so if we're doing more and more of that, which alleviates the stresses on a small hospital like ourselves. Um, next slide. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew. Yes, I get the privilege of talking about cost, everybody's favorite part of healthcare. Um, on the screen are services that relate to cost management that we do at uh, uh, here at Mount Scutney and with the system at large. Um, these are consistent with prior year submissions and things that we do on a daily, weekly, monthly, and annual basis. Um, and they result in some significant cost savings uh, when compared to doing the work on our own. Um, Wynn mentioned a few PSAs, um, some shared service, uh, finance. So for finance, we have access to beneficial uh, loan terms and rates. Uh, by being a part of the Dartmouth uh, Health Obligation Group, we have access to 
alternative investment strategies uh, and plans through the Dartmouth Master Investment uh, Program. We're part of NIA, the uh, GPO, Group Purchasing Organization, that gives us access to beneficial pricing. Uh, and we get even more benefit by being uh, a Dartmouth affiliate. So there's several levels and tiers of, of benefits. For pharmacy, uh, we have access to 340B programs and initiatives that combat uh, manufacturer restrictions. And I'll share a little bit more about that later. Uh, and you touched on it, shared services is a really big benefit for us. Uh, being part of the system, we get a lot of savings there. Um, you know, for example, this year, well, so shared savings are allocated on a proportional basis among the system for um, you know, system-wide activities that we all benefit from. And uh, quality is a big one. And we received an $800,000 credit just for quality um, because we spent $800,000 more proportionally to our affiliate members. Uh, and in large part, as of Cerner, you know, we have to do the same quality and compliance work that everybody else has to do, but we have to do it all on our own on Cerner Island. So as a critical access hospital, uh, by our nature, we're a high fixed cost organization. Um, you know, we, Medicare recognizes us as um, a critical community resource, providing care to a geographically and demographically disadvantaged uh, region. Uh, it's a highly valuable designation. It means a lot um, to us in the community. And it also means that, you know, by nature, we provide community-based care. Uh, I wish we did ortho. I wish we did plastics, uh, but we we don't. Um, you know, we do primary care and we do podiatry and the things that our community really does need. Um, but we still have to maintain the same conditions of participation as part of our hospitals. We have to keep our ED staffed and the lab and the rats, uh, rad staffed. Uh, we have to maintain minimum staffing volumes. Uh, we have to submit the same budgets that UVM does. But here at Mount Scutney, we have um, a culture of financial transparency and, and uh, cost management. Um, we develop and distribute monthly P&Ls to all of our department managers and to leadership and the board at large. Um, and we work with our management team to kind of train them on how to read those financial statements, what they mean, and how to turn them into action. Um, we value financial transparency. Our managers can see every invoice and every charge uh, from their providers. Um, we distribute biweekly payroll reports with uh, FTEs against budget and travelers and overtime. Everything, you know, we try and give our management the tools they need to manage their departments effectively. We have position control, um, which I've heard some other hospitals have as well. Um, you know, every FTE, new FTE, whether it's a net new position or a rehire or replacement, has to go through position control. Um, the manager has to apply for that, that posting. How annoying it is. And it goes to the senior team for that. approval. Yes, yes, it's all made of uh, senior leadership. Uh, we leverage uh, the NEA GPO as much as we can, but we're not obligated to use them. So we're able to kind of use our own resources to find good deals as well. And uh, Martha Colburn, our purchasing manager, is a rock star and is able to really navigate that role really well. Um, and for the costs that we do realize, the expenses that we see every day, you know, managing the cost report effectively has a significant impact um, on our bottom line and on our costs. Um, you know, one, one of my goals every year is to pay for myself through a cost report, you know, plan or study or initiative. And uh, this year I worked with Belinda uh, Needham Troutshire, our senior director of rehab and ancillary services. And we identified um, some employees were living in a, or living, they were, uh, to. assigned to a uh, non-reimbursable cost center, the rehab department uh, that's paid on DRG, so not cost base. But um, we realized that they were doing half of their work was, you know, for rehab and half of it was for acute. They were doing referral services. And so we created a new department 
allocated or assigned those employees there and then allocated their costs um, by admission statistics. And we were able to pick up 200 grand this year in perpetuity because of that uh, cost report optimization. And then of course, more DH system integration efforts uh, for FY25, which I'll talk about now. Um, as Wynn mentioned, we, no, I'm moving the slide. Here we go. Uh, Wynn mentioned we transitioned our benefit platform uh, this year to DHs, and uh, we saved 250 grand this year by doing that, by reduced management and overhead. Um, you know, and we passed that along to our employees so they would experience a lower premium increase for having to do that. Um, and we expect to continue to realize the benefits of being part of this platform by being a part of a larger risk pool. So we're seeing a lower uh, premium increase than we would have expected otherwise. As a side note, our, you know, doesn't really sound this right if you look at our PL because our benefits are going up significantly. And that's largely because we've, um, you know, adopted our HHR employees onto Mattis Gettney's books um, so that they could have access to those benefits and pay scales that we have at Scutney. Um, you know, it's the right thing to do and, um, for them and for us and for the community. But expenses will go up because of that. But there's an offsetting uh, increase in other operating revenue. Um, and of course, we have our phase one, the enterprise resource planning integration. Uh, of our CON, uh, which is expected to deliver some pretty good administrative synergies. I won't have to manage payroll anymore and I won't have to do AP and I won't have to do bank rec, so I'm very excited. Um, and that cost will go to DH and DH will fare proportionally. So on average, cost will go down. Um, we have to do a little investment to get there, uh, but i um, very excited about that. Uh, eagerly awaiting your response. Um, but uh, and we'll have access to best in class accounting, analytics, and HR tools. You know, we'll be able to deliver on some of the items that uh, we weren't able to deliver on this year, like segregating Medicare Advantage and including that part of future budget submissions. And then phase two is the um, electronic health record piece, uh, Epic integration, and uh, we hope and anticipate to see the same kind of synergies on the clinical side. <clears throat> um, for FY25 budget, the 340B alternative, alternative distribution model um, is a program uh, that Dartmouth is sponsoring and has developed to combat manufacturer restrictions in 340B uh, eligibility. They've essentially designated a warehouse, a central distribution warehouse as a primary pharmacy. They get all their drug orders there and then they redistribute it to a network of contract pharmacies. So really uh, ingenious and uh, great strategy to help you know, claw back some of this 340B revenue. Uh, we're gonna probably see 120K at least this year. So that's gonna go live January 1st. And um, shared services, talked about it already, but as Valley Regional comes online, as SVMC becomes more integrated, we're going to continue to see the benefits of uh, shared shared services. And uh, Celeste will actually explain a little bit more of the benefits about that. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, this, well, first of all, very happy to say, as Wynn mentioned, that Valley is now officially a part of Dartmouth Health, effective August 1st. So it's been a long time coming. <laughs> it's very happy now we have the opportunity to start working together. Um, and so this analysis that you're looking at was something that Dave Sandball had put together a few years ago to uh, outline to mainly the Valley why they should join Dartmouth Health and why they should partner with Mount Scutney. So the supply chain insurance and say reductions that you can see that Valley will eventually pick up They've already been realized by Mount Scutney and have been part of our budget for a while. Andrew's alluded to them, Wynn's talked about them. Um, management and staff, we say reductions, but really what they are is opportunities to share. So uh, Wynn mentioned a lab manager and a pulmonary manager, 340B resource and a uh, emergency services. We currently share those positions. It's been very successful. 
now effective August 1st. I am now here sh being shared between Valley and Mount Scotty. And we are, as Wynn mentioned, in, in searching for a permanent CEO that will be shared. So those are high cost positions. So to be able to split that in half is a huge benefit to a small rural hospital. Um, so, so that's all exciting. Our intention is to be able to develop, is to work with the accounting teams and to develop a uh, tracking mechanism between the two organizations so we can keep track of what it is that we're saving over time so we can share that with our board. And just because people do need to see that and we will be working on that together. This will happen over time, not expecting all these savings to be immediately right out of the gate, but we're very encouraged and taking the first step. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. Just wanted to highlight um, Vermont Act 119 briefly uh, and just share our updates to our free care policies and procedures and our income eligibility thresholds and discount rates and, you know, just communicate that we've worked in lockstep with the HCA in um, not only beating the letter of the law, but I think the intent in our policies reflect a more proactive approach in uh, free care. Um, and we recognize the importance uh, of providing that to, to the people who've kind of fallen through the cracks. So um, proud, proud to have updated it and worked with HCA on this piece. Um, you know, we also recognize that over the past couple of years, our free care uh, expenses, if you will, or deductions have gone down over time. And uh, we expect this to turn, turn that around and uh, bring us back to historical budgeted levels. Next couple of slides are kind of some sh short form financials just to give a brief overview. Our gross patient care revenue uh, budget to budget is up 0.8%. Our deductions from revenue are down 3.5%. Uh, and our NPR plus, so I'm coining this term here, uh, NPR net patient revenue plus fixed perspective payments plus risk reserves plus other population health management payments is NPR plus. Um, that's like an adaptive, you know, what does NPSR benchmark is really talking about. So when we say NPSR, I just think of patient revenue. But when you say NPSR, from what I understand, we're talking about NPR plus FPP and these other items. NPR plus. Uh, that's going up 4.3%. 4, 4 Our other operating revenue is going up 12%, seems significant, and that's because of the HHR leaseback revenue um, and this pickup in 340B revenue. And for operating expenses, those are going up about 6% budget to budget, HHR onboarding again, uh, as well as pharmaceutical and medical supply inflation and wage package and um, traveler. traveler so, yeah. Yeah. And so our, our operating margin is fi uh, 530,000 or 0.7%. And our total margin is uh, 5%. Thanks to our friends at DH Treasury. Um, the performance of the MIP is projected to be about 4.5% uh, realized and unrealized next year, and uh, the shared service allocation. Uh, one thing I mentioned earlier, we lacked our FY24 budget, we had a $990,000 expense allocation, but this year in the FY25 budget, we have a $440,000 expense credit. So a huge swing and a huge impact on our bottom line and uh, many other great feature for our, for our budget next year. Balance sheet real briefly, stable, um, and uh, we just want to focus on our property plant equipment. That's a priority for us. And why we're all here, uh, our benchmarks, um, our budget against benchmarks. So NPR plus, commercial rate growth, gross, gross price increase in our operating margin. Um, so we're at 4.3 versus the Green Mountain Care Board's 3.5, but how we came to that number uh, is really important. We, we start the budgeting process uh, April 1st, pretty much my birthday, best birthday present ever every year. Uh, but we all get together in a room with the clinical leaders and senior leaders and finance staff, 
and we talk about what uh, you know this historical trends, historical volumes, known changes, provider productivity, provider benchmarks and minimum standards, patients uh, per hour, um, expectations, um, hopes and dreams, uh, and we set a, a volume um, you know as a group volume budget, and then we take that back to our uh, greater management team and we say, hey, what do we need to do to make these volumes? Uh, all of the man managers set their own volume budgets and their own expense budgets. So it creates this real account uh, you know, culture of accountability. Um, and I don't, I don't set anybody's budgets except for the accounting department. Uh, but I do provide feedback and guidance um, to all of them. But so we, we have the revenue uh, and then we have the expense to support those volumes. And then we consider our margins uh, and the expectations of uh, the board, of uh, our board of trustees, of Dartmouth Health, and you know, our, own, our own expectations uh, as senior leaders and finance people. Uh, so this year in consideration of the CON uh, and the extra expense and not wanting to pass that through to you know, Vermonters, we set a 0.7% operating margin, and then we back in uh, to that to get the gross rate increase that we need to, to make all of this magic happen. Um, so our 4.3% is a budget that considers provider you know, productivity, considers volume, service mix, payer mix, and the price impact. Um, the commercial rate growth from what I, you know, conversations with Elena is, is the net increase and the net impact to commercial you know, commercial price. So what's but what's important for us really at Madison County is the gross request that we're requesting um, of three point five percent. So uh, we have a net realization with our from um, three point five times two point two. Use your screen. Sweet. Oh, yes. Can you hear us? So we seem to have lost our screen. We got you. We can hear you fine. Can you see my, um, let's see, the request dash NPSR slide? Yep. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, I'm flying blind, but. You guys can see, and that's what's important. Um, we introduced the screen la or this slide last year. Uh, realized rates of uh, rate increases. And our model uses historical reimbursement rates to um, to analyze the impact of rate increases. It's not perfect, but um, it's worked really well over the years. Uh, so our NPR increase is four point three. We have a three point five percent rate increase, and the net realization of that. Uh, is 1.9 percent uh, because our total average reimbursement among the payers is about 55 percent. So Medicare, we usually see about 49 percent, um, and I'm happy to see that number because our cost to charge ratio is 48 percent on the cost report, so it makes sense. Medicaid uh, is coming in at 27 percent of, of charges. Commercial, on average, among all of our payers, is about 61 percent. Uh, and so a total 55%, 1.9. And the difference is 2.4%, and that's made up of volume, uh, payer mix, service mix, um, and other stuff like uh, bad debt free care and risk reserves and population health management payments. The graphic on the right, uh, admittedly, is old from last year, but it's still relevant. Um, you know, our, our rate request is right smack in the middle of our historical range. And it really just shows how consistent we are, how reliable we are in, in managing ourselves and our financials. Uh, and uh, to me, it says we're in the top three, so I'll take it. Just a little extra perspective on our rate request. Um, the realized you know, impact of the 3.5 is 1.9%, and it's lower than most inflation categories. It's lower than our wage package of 2% 2 that you know, company-wide in October and then 1% uh, for target market increases. Our benefits 
uh, expenses are going up 8%. Our pharmacy inflation that we're seeing, pharmaceutical inflation is anywhere from 3 to 10% with our highest drugs like infliximab going up 4%. Um, medical supplies, we did some analysis. We think it's going up 3.4, foods going up. All, all this to say, you know, we're doing our part here in reducing inflation for Vermonters. Our rate request is lower than most expenses that we're seeing and that it, other Vermonters are seeing. So I think it's a fair, fair ask. Um, so we haven't really talked about travelers, which you, you have on the last slide. Sure. Um, we continue to operate with a number of travelers. I think we're around 20 travelers right now in our system. Um, essentially, our overnight um, nursing staff is almost exclusively travelers, despite our best efforts to uh, recruit and attract uh, nurses to come work at our campus. Obviously, we're right on the New Hampshire border. Uh, Dartmouth has done a lot of recruiting of new grads that are attracted to a higher acuity setting. Um, so we've made a big investment, as you've probably heard from some of the other um, hospitals, and I've probably heard in some of the presentations, um, uh, working with the Vermont University system and for us, uh, River Valley Community College, creating a pipeline. So we have, we're really working hard on growing our own uh, uh, caregivers, which takes time. So we have programs to become a LNA, an LPN and an RN, uh, which happens over a period of time uh, with then with uh, agreements to stay working at us for a period of time for debt forgiveness. So that is underway uh, and has been underway. And so we have the pipeline in place. And so we see that we will be able to chip away one way at it over time is um, through that process of making sure. We also have a dare to care program here. So every summer we have usually about a dozen call, uh, high school students here um, that spend eight weeks with us to learn all about the career opportunities inside healthcare. And a, and a number of those over time have gone into healthcare and have begun to come back to us over the years. So um, just want to point that out where I've heard some other hospitals have, have, have been more successful in, in um, getting out of using travelers, given our location uh, and some of the challenges we have uh, that um, we're working very hard at growing our own, uh, which is um, a more sustainable long term, because the market just has changed for a lot of, of, of clinical people who will move around or or make uh, economic decisions uh, about where they want to practice. The old three legs on the healthcare stool: quality, access, and cost. Um, they're they're all highly related, highly correlated. As we continue to make investments in healthcare reform, um, looking towards the future of healthcare delivery here in Vermont, um, making incremental quality and access improvements, uh, you know, we have to consider the cost and we have to consider how we're going to pay for that. And uh, just as important, how are we going to keep this uh, facility going? So we have to make investments in in the property plan and equipment, uh, and we need your help to do that. And speaking of property plan and equipment, our FY25 budget is $4.8 million, 2.3 of which is for the first phase of the CON. Um, phase two will be in uh, FY26, uh, but the remaining 2.5 million is for routine medical device replacement and some infrastructure critical upgrades, uh, most notably uh, our chiller. It's going. Um, it's you know it supplies cold water to rooftop HVAC units, and uh, we're already at max capacity, and it's, it's time to change it. So um, it's at the end of its useful life. So yeah, and when we do replace it, we'll be able to replace it with a more efficient uh, model, and then we'll be able to upgrade our rooftop units to more efficient. Um, systems really driving uh, cost and environmental benefit down the line. Um, historically, we have been underspending in capital uh, because of COVID. Uh, bandwidth and supply chain was, was seriously impacted, and uh, we're proud to report that we are hitting, we're on budget, uh, $2.5 million this year in FY24. Uh, and uh, I'll be honest, I'd like to see, see it go higher, but we have a significantly higher age plant as an organization because of those things. Yeah. Yeah. And so our last slide from me, 
just a brief overview of uh, our benchmarks over time. Uh, again, kind of illustrating our consistency and reliability in our narrow range of rate increases and our ability to uh, manage costs here well uh, at Manus County. I'll turn it back over to Wim to talk about uh, risks and opportunities. Yeah, so I'm just gonna close out with the risks and the opportunities of our budget. Um, hopefully you can see the slide uh, in front of you. We've already talked a little bit about um, the wage pressures that we face. Um, and I think every hospital faces it, but maybe maybe more for those of us uh, near the New Hampshire border, closer to Massachusetts. It's a regional uh, recruiting pool now. That's where the, and so we have the, the wage pressures that have, that have come upon us that we have to respond to. And we also live in a, in a limited market for, for local talent as well. You know, Dartmouth um, has opened a new tower that has, um, as, they get, as they staff that up, um, demands a lot of a new staff. We continue to you know, deal with the, the great resignation. Uh, we've had a lot of retirement of people, some of them retiring early. Our workforce is aging. And I already just touched on the reliance that we continue to have on, uh, on uh, travelers despite um, our best efforts to, to recruit and retain uh, uh, folks. Um, another risk is just um, relying on Medicare and Medicaid risk that we need to perform well for that. Um, and that the incentives that we get for population health management um, are the reimbursement that we get for that or the, the bonuses we get for that are less than the cost of uh, providing those services. They're, they're, they're much needed and they, they are effective at lowering costs overall, but it is a it's a challenge, one, to staff them and, and, and two, to finance them. We are, you know, dependent on DISH um, as a disproportionate share hospital, and Andrew touched on 340B uh, as an opportunity for us to regain some of the earlier revenue that we had um, before that market started to change dramatically, and Dartmouth has been particularly helpful for that, and so we're implementing things right now that we believe will come to fruition uh, starting in January uh, for that will, that will impact next year's budget. Uh, under opportunities for us, our last slide uh, before we go into the question um, is question phase. Uh, really, the um, great opportunity for us is the integration and work that we will be doing over the next years with Valley Regional Hospital um, as we come closer together. And I would say into some level of, of alignment and joint management uh, and the opportunity to share even more staff back and forth between our organizations when um, one, one organization may have a better bench strength than another. Uh, or that you just don't need a full FTE of a particular employee, but between the two organizations we do. Um, and that has been a, a good long-term relationship we've had and we see the benefits of that coming. Um, obviously, our reliance um, and partnership with, with Dartmouth Health is incredibly important to us. And Andrew touched on a number of the things that are going on that will provide us better service, better back office at a lower cost. Um, we look at uh, IT integration, which we touched on as well, uh, the moving to enterprise-wide software for accounting and HR and other back office functions to be followed by moving to Epic. I think you've heard a number of challenges from other hospitals along uh, these hearings of the challenges of working with Cerner uh, around revenue cycle and sharing information with academic medical centers is particularly challenging. I will say that we submitted our CON uh, for to go uh, through this process in April, and we're still awaiting uh, our CON approval. I think we're in the final stage, um, but I would just say that you know if we look at things that Green Mountain Care Board in the state can look at, the CON process takes too long. It's not moving at the speed of business. Uh, we're in the planning phases of, of for Epic and, and not for Epic, but for our ERP component now. Uh, and so we need to get that approved so we can move forward. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, that was one of Bruce Hammond's uh, key opportunities for us was to move to Epic. So any support you can provide on, on moving that CLN forward would be greatly appreciated. Um, obviously, um, we are awaiting some new primary care providers that we have, uh, we have signed on uh, and they will be arriving. But as you also know, uh, new providers take time to ramp up in their practice. Uh, we've talked about 340B um, revenue cycle improvement. We've been doing a lot of work uh, despite the challenges with Cerner to improve our revenue cycle before we move on to the Dartmouth Health platform. And we expect to see some improvement and we are seeing some improvement in that, but again, that is incremental as well. Um, 
And then just market share, uh, making sure that we retain our market share. Um, we have a very good reputation. Um, you know, we have shorter ER wait times in most places, so people seek us out. We have uh, an excellent reputation uh, around our rehab services. I don't think I go anywhere and someone finds out that I'm from Mount Scutney and they begin to tell me a story of a loved one that's had care here from around the region and beyond. It's really quite amazing. Um, and then one thing we just haven't really touched on uh, and much down below is ophthalmology. We've long had an ophthalmology service here. We do a lot of cataract surgery um, and historically that's been with our own employed ophthalmologists. As Dartmouth looks at specializing in certain services at its community hospitals that are more appropriate uh, at community hospitals and at the academic medical center, we now have three Dartmouth ophthalmologists that each practice uh, here a day a week and are in the OR providing uh, cataract surgery, largely for Vermont residents at a lower cost uh, than at the academic medical center. And it's just one example, along with um, more general surgery coming here to our general surgeons uh, for appropriate general surgery. Uh, again, Vermont residents coming back into Vermont for care. So um, those are the opportunities that we have that we're working hard to realize and um, where we feel pretty confident about a number of them uh, as, we, as, we, as we move forward and we're keenly focused on them to make sure that you know, we, we have been a very stable, uh, well-performing hospital for a long period of time, even with a very narrow 1% margin over the past uh, decade. Uh, but, um, you know, we are, if, if, if nothing else, we are consistent in our quality and our service level and our financial performance. Uh, and um, we're committed to continuing doing that and looking forward to doing that in closer partnership uh, with, our, with our new partner, the hospital, under joint, joint leadership uh, with Valley Regional. So with that, I'll conclude my remarks and we look forward to taking any questions you might have. Thank you all for your presentation. Um, I'll turn it open to the other board members for any questions they may have. I can start off with a bunch of questions here. Just uh, thank you so much. Um, appreciate the narrative, community needs assessment, presentation, um, and if you come in here, your comments, many of them uh, consistent with other hospitals, and I think a lot of our own goals, so thank you. Um, so I have a whole, a few, a whole bunch of questions, I guess, or a few questions. We'll see where it goes. Um, uh, I guess a few things from your presentation today that you said that you're not open to new primary care patients. And I'm just curious what would happen if a patient goes to your emergency department and, uh, needs follow-up with primary care. Uh, are you able to sort of get emergent people in or urgent people in if into the practice, or it's just, you have to send them out of the region for primary care. So right now, if they are um, patients in emergency department, if they are already established with our practice, we are looking to get them in early for a follow up. Those who are not established with our practice, we will try our best to accommodate them or um, get them follow up elsewhere. But um, I think that's part of you know, we're trying to recruit more primary care providers to be able to open up our practices. Um, we have, you know, over the past year or two, we've had primary care providers leave, and we're trying to. Uh, we're, we're trying to improve our access by recruiting more providers so that we can be able to uh, capture these patients who do come to our emergency departments. Okay. So uh, not clearly defined that a patient who's seen there, who's a local patient without a PCP would be able to get into your clinic for primary care follow-up. Correct. Uh, on a different topic, I'm trying to understand the reimbursement for your cr chronic uh, skilled nursing facility patients, the swing bed patients, and the acute patients. I assume these all reimburse differently from Medicare and commercial. And I was wondering if you could give me some insight into sort of how that works from, uh, from the various payer sources. Much better. Sure. I'll start okay. maybe gonna fill in the gaps. Okay. Um, you know, Medicare per diem, uh, based off the cost, swing, um, there's a swing per diem and a, a, a acute per diem um, that comes from the cost report. Uh, for commercial payers, uh, some we have uh, fixed fee schedules and some we have percentage of charge. 
uh, for Medicaid, I believe it's um, like a per diem as well. Just payment, right? Is it a prospective payment? The DRG, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, so for for commercial patients that end up in a chronic skilled nursing bed, are they paying? Is that being paid out of commercial insurance rates, uh, like uh, at at a higher rate than a skilled nursing facility, or is it a similar rate to a typical skilled nursing facility? Um, well, I there are so few, honestly. <laughs> Commercial swing, like I don't, I can't even think of any to be honest. Uh, yeah. But it would probably be a depend yeah. on the payer and depend on the contractual agreement. Yeah, I can speak more to other um, other hospitals that I've been at, and it, as Andrew said, it's it's rare that you have someone who has commercial who ends up in a long term swing situation. But what um, what will happen is you may have to negotiate a specific rate with that insurer. Uh, if it really will depend on what the person has for a, a commercial plan. And um, usually, what we would do is maybe have to do a single case agreement. It would end up being a daily rate. It, it, I'm sure it would be very competitive with if they went somewhere else. Um, we don't see them often. We don't expect to make money on those patients who just want to be cared for. And uh, I think in many cases, they end up probably going into the rehab unit if they need longer term care. I could probably speak to that from a kind of frontline perspective. A lot of our commercial payers um, don't receive chronic long term kind of skilled care here, like they receive some home level care. Um, if they have skilled needs, they will continue to, uh, commercial payers will continue to. Um, reimbursed as per the contract, contractual agreement, but once their skill needs end and they don't need more PT, OT, or intensive nursing care, then a lot of the commercial payers will likely um, stop their coverage. And we would, we, that doesn't necessarily mean we would immediately discharge the patient's home. We would have to, we would oftentimes plan ahead and work with the families to determine uh, whether it is safe to go home and if they do need to stay here for us to find a better long-term solution, then we would keep them here and we would work on applying for long-term care Medicaid, work with the family for other um, solutions so that it's sort of best and safe for the patient. Okay. Thanks for that and just, um, perspective. Um, a couple things from the narrative that I would just had quick questions on. Uh, there was a discussion of a GI surgeon, uh, and I was trying to figure out if that's a gastroenterologist or a general surgeon. Gastro, that's a gastroenterologist. We have a couple For, of okay that that, um, that come here um, uh, on a on a once a week basis right now, and so the, that's where the GI is. And that's for colonoscopies, is what that was referring yes. to. Okay. Another thing from the narrative is um, I'm trying to understand uh, sort of your engagement and perspective on one care. Uh, there's discussion of inconsistent and untimely data reporting that's not communicated effectively, and that PHM payments are eat eaten up by participation fees and risk pooling. But then you sort of go on to note there's a bunch of components of what I would think is a modern healthcare practice should have, like social workers, case management teams patient insurance liaisons that are not covered by PHM payments. So I'm, I'm just trying to think, you know, I'm trying to understand if, if, if uh, you know, what are your interests in, I mean, it sounds like one care, the way this is written is not a particularly beneficial for Madiscutney Hospital, but yet you're signed up to be part of one care's network. So I'm trying to understand how you approach this, this decision and this relationship. Yeah, uh, our, to be honest, our financial participation with the ACO is not beneficial, but the underlying activities and um, reform efforts are important to us and we believe in them and we're, we want to pursue them. Uh, fortunately, uh, Blueprint Community Health um, is you know, funding a large, larger portion of our uh, healthcare reform and um, 
community engagement uh, work, uh, community health work. Um, the loop and what the year. I mean, Blueprint is very important to us and helps us provide some of that that infrastructure. I think one of the challenges that I see with One Care is that we have patients assigned to us that are not in our panels. We're assigned patients regionally, so we're responsible for sort of the health and well-being of 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 Medicare patients that are not that are not ours. Uh, so it's um, it's an interesting model that I don't think other states have. I'm not familiar with it. Um, so it's um, it's a challenge, I guess I'd say for for organizations, especially our size. Uh, but we believe in the we believe in the long game of it, uh, and so we are committed to it, and we invest a lot in it, and, and spend a lot of time and effort around it to make sure that um, we are really thinking about the population health. Um, and it's so um, we're all in. It's just it doesn't it doesn't. Pay us as well as we as it as it as it could and should. And when you say the long game, can you expand that just briefly? The long game, the the, the long you know the long term perspective of having a healthier population that's getting the right care at the right time and the appropriate mix of services to make sure that people stay well and out of the hospital in high cost care settings when they. When um, if they have the, if they're given the skills and tools they need and the wraparound services, um, overall you know we all believe that the cost will be lower, uh, and so we firmly believe in that. Um, you know it's just when you are an organization our size with our margin it's it's you know and we're not unique. This is true for everybody. So we're not like we're precious and rare, um, and I think everybody would probably in Vermont, especially small hospitals, probably say the same thing. We all believe in it. That's why we're here. That's why you're here, uh, is to to really look at the long term health of the state and its population and the viability of um, the delivery system. So we 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 believe that and we support that. Um, but we also call out the challenges in it. Yeah. Um, Andrew, I really appreciated your uh, discussion about terminology with things like NPR and how we use NPR and how you use NPR. There's a bunch of other terms that I think I picked up through your submission that fall into this category that I think we need to work to clarify a common understanding of definitions. Um, one is prices. I think we look at prices as what is paid to an organization for healthcare services and look at charges as what you charge. So when you look at things like RAND pricing, that's not RAND charges, that's RAND, that is what is paid to the organization. Um, so a lot of the health price transparency work is really uh, the not charges, but prices and what is actually paid to organizations for services delivered. And so I think at least myself speaking, and maybe we, we need to have a, a broader conversation on that. That's how I, 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 I would use that term. Um, that's fair. And, you know, even CMS, see if the price transparency rule is charges, not reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you say price, we're thinking reimbursement. I agree. Yeah, price. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, what what is reimbursed? Yeah, so a change in price, I think of as a change in re of what would be paid for said services, not what is the, you know, not the sticker price, but the sale price that's actually the one that's paid for. Uh, yeah. Um, and that is a very fair point. And the challenge with that is that every single person that walks through the door may that service may be paid for differently depending on their insurance. So I, Correct. Not just with what you're saying, but it, 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 it is, it's a complicated industry just for that very reason. Yeah. Um, there's a couple things in the workbook that I don't know how familiar you are with the details of the workbook, but I'll, I'll describe them to you and see if they make sense to you. Um, when I was looking at your inpatient commercial revenue, projection from 24 to 25, it's essentially flat, $500 more inpatient commercial revenue. Um, and in outpatient commercial revenue, uh, I'm sorry, that's outpatient commercial revenue, essentially flat. In, I, I, sorry, I have my notes backwards here. Your inpatient revenue has a growth of 23%. Your outpatient revenue is totally flat. 
which confused me if you're working on access, increasing ophthalmologic services, increasing um, trying to get people in the clinic and getting a rate increase, how your commercial revenue is staying flat. To me, I would think that's a decrease. If you have increased price and flat revenue, that would mean to me a decrease in utilization. So are you predicting a decrease in utilization for outpatient commercial resources, services? It depends on the service mix. Um, for I'll comment quickly on inpatient. You know, we're trying, we have an increased um, projection for volumes for uh, our acute admissions. Um, at the expense or offsetting swing admissions. So maybe that speaks to uh, the commercial piece. And also, we we fill out these workbooks using our revenue models that rely on historical reimbursement rates, payer mix volumes, service mix. So it's not perfect. Um, I think by and large, you need to look at the big picture when it comes to those workbooks. Um, and, uh, you know, we tried to fill it out the best we could, but every year it's a new one and uh, we didn't have a lot of time as many changes. So, you know. Okay, um, I, 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 I can understand that too. I mean, I think it's, we're trying to, trying to look at things um, broken out more so we can understand where where growth, you know, growth and expense and uh, expense, not your side of expense, but also system expense are. Um, I guess my concern when I saw that was, is there an initiative to try to move um, commercial, outpatient commercial services out of Mattiscutney to other DH hospitals? No. No, I don't think there's any concern at effort like that. We want the commercial to stay with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. So in yeah. and around sort of this topic of, of brand and prices and commercial um, expenses, one of the things that I think is striking for Maniscutney in, in the RAND data, and we have some other other confidential data that sort of directionally supports this, is that you're pretty like pretty dramatically high outpatient and inpatient prices. So I don't know if you've looked at the standardized pricing in the RAND data, but Escutney is in, you know, in the, uh, I don't have the decile here, in the ninth or 10th decile, with Dartmouth actually being 22% lower and Springfield, your other sort of closest hospital being 31% lower. And for inpatient prices, Dartmouth is 23% lower and Springfield's actually a third of the price, 66% lower. So the inpatient thing I'm trying to understand, I assume that's somewhat due to this kind of unique inpatient mix that you have that somehow you're not able to charge, I, I would assume. But what do you think? I guess what do you think is driving that inpatient and outpatient price that we see in, in, in RAND and other data? And these are again pay, paid prices, not charged prices. The inpatient is 100% the fact that we have a distinct part the unit for rehab in the, you know, excuse everything. Yeah, it's 14 day average length of stay versus uh, three. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, highly complex, comprehensive services. So the inpatient is 100% uh, the DPU. And for outpatient, um, and I don't have a great answer. I think it's, you know, our prices have been established long ago and we try and work. Um, to improve them best we can. We did a major restructuring in radiology in 2020 where we reduced our like gross prices by $1.5 million. So we, we do try and address those. I would just say we're a critical access hospital um, with, the with, the, with the DPU. So uh, I think that. A, a critical access hospital, what was the, with a? The distinct park unit would be oh, yep. the, re the rehab skews it. For the inpatient and then the outpatient, um, it, it, it critical access hospital, but again, Springfield's down the road. Uh, I put my notes away on that. A third less. Is there, is there, I guess the question I have is when I looked at your community needs assessment, it had the second highest pressing health need was the cost of health insurance, and the third was the cost of healthcare services. So I'm trying to figure out 
you know, how, and this I think is a huge balance. And we come across this, I mean, this is my second year doing this, and this was clearly a, a driving conversation on several hospital budgets last year is how do you justify high prices in your community charged to the community members uh, balanced with being financially stable and having a hospital in your community? And so I guess my question when I when I saw that is, you know, are there things that you can do or what are you working on? How do you approach trying to reduce the price of health care paid by your local residents for your services there? Uh, well, I think a couple of things that, you know, as as you saw in our presentation, we we're making some active changes to between partnering and value to bring some costs down. As far as what patients pay the Act 119, we will be more aggressive with um, getting people on insurance on on the financial assistance plan. So the, the cost of the consumer, one would think, is out of pocket for the patient, we have zero increase budgeted for that. Um, if and if anything, we are anticipating that our charity care, our financial assistance will go up this next year. Um, it, you know, our overall our margin is very, very low, you know, 0. 0.7, enough to keep us going. It, you know, some of the challenges that we do face, again, our costs are fairly fixed, but our volumes compared to Springfield are, I would imagine, significantly lower. So you take that fixed cost and you just aren't spreading it across as many people in the first place. So the whole point of critical access is to cover your cost. And while on the global scale, our cost might be lower if you looked at us budget to budget, but when you divide it by the number of people that we actually see, then the cost per unit may actually be somewhat skewed. And that may be partly what you're seeing there. Fairly new, so I, I'm just kind of speaking off the top of my head here, it's but it's so historically what I know, yeah. I mean, these are th and thanks for these are hard questions, and I think that these are the things that uh, you know, as a board member, you <laughs> have a lot of trouble sleeping at night is trying to balance, you know, yeah. um, places like a Scutney where you know it, it appears there's pretty high prices. You provide a valuable, you know, resource in your community, um, mm -hmm. and and how do we sort of try to work? towards a place where, you know, these prices can come down, you know, and operational efficiency improvements are, you know, are a huge, a huge driver of that. So I, I look forward to sort of seeing the, the, the gains from that over, over time. Um, I think that's, that's all I have for now. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it a lot. I can jump in next if that's all right with uh, you, you, Chair. Yes, please. Could I just ask that you, since we cannot, we can't see you anymore. <laughs> if you would just announce who you are, who's asking the question, that would be helpful, just so we have reference. Oh yeah, um, this is Tom Walsh, um, and I had forgotten that you couldn't see us. Um, I'm sorry about that. It can be it frustrating. Be a blank screen that we're staring at. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've, I've been there before and, um, yeah, sorry about that difficulty. Um, so, you know, as, as Dave was just saying, um, you know, I, I have some questions. I think some of them may, um, feel hard as we go along, but I want to start out by just commending you on your patient experience scores and the quality initiatives and focus that you've, you've brought consistently, um, I moved to the Upper Valley in the late 90s to work at Dartmouth at a, at a multidisciplinary spine center. Um, and we worked closely with Mount Escutney there. And I've, so I've long been aware of the good work you're doing. Um, I also wanted to um, let you know that I appreciate the tight targeting of your um, request. I don't remember the slide number, but I did notice that you're in the top three um, regarding consistency um, with your budget increase, uh, your your budget requests year in and year out. Um, and I've also noticed that the variance between the 
budget you submit and the actuals at uh, financial year end are among the tightest. And I think those are all great things. Um, uh, Dave asked about uh, your comments regarding the ACO. Um, and I had a couple questions there, but the one that persists that he didn't quite get to, I want to make sure that I did my math correctly. Um, you state you receive roughly $220,000 per year um, for that participation, um, but then you list several fees and those fees, if my math is correctly it correct, amount to over a million dollars a year. So it sounded it read as though you're contributing four to five times what you receive in pure dollar amounts. Um, it does that match with your experience? Is that what you were trying to imply as you listed those things? Essentially, yeah. Um, our PHM, you know, per member per month, population health management payments around 220k a year. Uh, our participation fee. The infrastructure fee is around $400,000 a year. So right off the bat, we're at a loss. And then there's the risk. So at the time we were budgeting, um, we were set to, we were on the hook for 600 grand. Have you discussed this with um, OneCare? Uh, we asked, because it was a delayed settlement response. Um, you know, this is from 2022 or 2023, excuse 2023. me. Um, and it was not the final number. So we were trying to get the final number. Uh, okay. You know, we reach out to one care to talk about it. But yeah, I hope that you do. We haven't seen, uh, I haven't um, seen those type of fees and the, the total received broken out that way before um, with other hospitals. So, um it was a claim you know or that they list as part of their distributions like blueprint cht money which is medicare money but it just flows through them so i feel like they're claiming it in the pcmh money but we would get that anyways okay well it was a, it was a notable part of of your narrative and i i just wanted to um follow up on it um i'd like to turn toward the community benefit section of the narrative. And um, in that you describe um, many volunteer activities and participation with Meals on Wheels. And you also mentioned the Windsor Connection Resource Center. Could you, could you tell us a little bit more about the Connection Resource Center, please? Yeah, so we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, um, this is Dr. Herbert. M. So we have a Windsor Resource Center down to Main Street, downtown Windsor. Um, and that houses where our volunteers in action team, um, and they you know, are, it's led by a community programs uh, manager, Amanda Jordan-Smith, who, you know, her role is to really um, facilitate and manage a large group of volunteers that will help with meals on wheels, um, help with transport, um, help really provide a lot of community services uh, across our Windsor region. That Windsor Resource Center also houses um, other resources like HCRS um, and counselors from Turning Point to provide those services uh, at the community level. Um, and so they, they also provide other services, whether it's um, you know help to address food insecurity, clothing, um, and where families. Um, individuals from the community can stop in yeah. and, um, you know, essentially pick up things that they need. Um, so there's a food shelf, there's a clothing bank. She also then, coordinates Veggie Can Go in our region. Yeah. And then we have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a Mass County Health Connections, which uh, um, a team run by Kelly Rapp, who helps, um, who works in coordination with Amanda Jordan-Smith and the Windsor Resource Center, and they help patients um, sign up for if they don't have any medical insurance they will help them enroll uh, assist them enrolling in medical insurance or if there's medications that they can't afford um, she will work with the insurance companies work with the pharmaceutical companies try to um, get them on you know try to 
discounts or coupons so that it makes healthcare and medications more affordable or maybe even free for patients. Um, or is the resource for Windsor um, region here? She also Windsor. has some grant dollars that we have that allow for dental care and emergency dental care and some other things. So it's the it's the nexus in our community and it's embedded deep in downtown where folks most in need of those services can easily and comfortably access them. Uh, and it's been a very successful model for us to um, really get at the core of the, some of the socioeconomic challenges of, of our main community that we serve and beyond. And we, you know, we, we do, um, through Historic Homes of Running Meads Kitchen, uh, provide meal. We, we, we do all the meals on wheels um, five days a week for our community. I think we had 75 to 90 meals a day come out of that kitchen and you know we don't we lose money on every meal but again not much just incrementally but it's an important key service and we're the ones that can provide it through our kitchen so uh, i appreciate um the further explanation it sounds like a lot of good is going on there um the the Lown institute is um a think tank that calculates um a hospital's community benefits um, and compares that to their tax exemption um, dollars. And in 2023, um, according to their calculation, your community benefit amounted to about $1.9 million, while tax exemptions totaled about 3.2, or a difference of a deficit, receiving more in tax breaks than providing in community benefits of $1.3 million. Um, that might be something to um, that fair share index, I, I know you're focused on doing a lot of good for your community. That might be something that would be um, helpful to look at. Yeah, I'll um, comment on that real quick if, if it's okay. Um, yeah, of course. I'm from, from Schedule H from the 990. And My apologies for interrupting. I'm so sorry, Mr. Hearing Officer. Um, <laughs> um, I I lost um, I lost you guys for a second. So if Mr. Um Garami, Garami can start again, I apologize. No worries. I uh, I did a little bit of digging into the Lound Fair Share Index, and if I'm not mistaken, I think the data comes from Schedule H and the 990. Um, and having helped fill that out for the first time this year, uh, I think I have a little bit of insight. You know, that doesn't, I don't think that includes, you know, our One Care Vermont dues or our spending in um, you know, our community health team. I don't think it includes our HHR subsidy or our health care reform risk um, or bad debt and free care. So it's a good measure to look at, but I'm not sure that it's all encompassing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, we historically, plus we historically had to report those things anyway yeah and uh, a lot of what's reported on the 990 depending on what he's looking at there's the net community benefit or the gross so yeah. great um I'm, I'm glad you're getting more uh familiar with it i think it, it's um they've been working with it they've been doing it for three or four years now um, and I think they continue to uh, refine their methods. And the more communication we can have back and forth about that and learn what is contained in those numbers, I think that's for the better. Um, so I wrote down the things that you were just sharing, and I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn to your profit and loss statement, if we don't mind. And, and just one question there under the summary statement of revenue and expenses. Um, 15 million of the 23 million reported there um, is other. So over half of, of what's contained there. I was wondering if you could um, just explain a little bit more to us about what's in other in, in that line item. Other operating revenue? Yep. Um, yeah, there's big chunk is 340B. Uh, it really, you know, I think it's 1.5 million just related to HHR's um, lease back revenue. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's two. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
uh, blueprints about grant revenues were often reported as other. Um, so grant revenue is uh, also has corresponding or correlating expenses. So it's really pass through revenue. That's a big piece. Uh, foundation program revenue. That's a big piece. Um, cafeteria. Okay. Cafeteria is bumping now. <laughs> um, yeah, cafeteria revenue. Uh, sale of uh, pharmaceuticals to employees. Um, it uh, includes, well, depending on this p &L, but uh, it can include the fixed perspective payments, at least on our, on our p &L. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the p that you're talking about, but um, yeah, those are some of the bigger items. Okay, um, thanks for clarifying. Um, with, um, I know, Board member Merman also asked some questions about um, the RAND data. Um, so I've just got uh, one that um, he hadn't asked already. Um, and instead of looking at the standardized prices the way that he was, um, I'm looking at uh, prices relative to Medicare. And your total facility price is listed at 203% of Medicare. And the break-even price that they um, describe and calculate is 127%. That's a gap of 76 points. And, and that gap is considered an assessment of efficiency. And to be honest, 76 isn't that bad. We've, we've seen much higher. Um, but one hospital last week um, in Vermont had a gap of 11 points. And so I, I'm just wondering what you... Um, what you make of those numbers and your efficiency, productivity, and what work are you doing um, in those areas? Well, I can comment that we are one of, this is what Dave told me, um, <laughs> but uh, we're one of few, or fewer and fewer reimbursement mechanisms are charge-based. And some of our top commercial payers are percentage of charge still, which is really, really good, you know, for us, frankly. Um, it helps pay for the Medicaid underfunding and Medicare sequestration. Um, you know, in the end, Advantage. and Medicare Advantage plans. Um, so you know, maybe it's a measure of efficiency of how good we are at contracting. Um, but uh, that's well, that's one aspect. Yeah, I and I, and on. I think uh, you know I personally have not looked at any of this data, did not know they existed. So maybe that is something in the future that Andrew and I can can start poking into. Great. Sounds like think, there's some tools out there. Yeah, I, and I I think um, you do a, you do a great job describing the the quality of care that you deliver and the um, efforts that you put into it um, and seeing similar um, efforts with efficiency and productivity would be reassuring as, um, as also Dave pointed out, your prices are quite high um, relative to places around you. Um, it also in your narrative, um, you had a statement, uh, I'll quote, it's, on top of financial pressures, regulatory pressure to reduce costs and increase investments creates a conflicting and uncertain operating environment and only adds additional administrative efforts and costs. And I was wondering if you could help us understand that. I'd, I'd really like to um, make sure that I understand what you mean with that sentence. Well, it's to... Um... Executives who've worked outside of Vermont can probably best comment. I think <laughs> there are some administrative burdens across the healthcare industry as a whole. I mean, one classic example is are the Medicare Advantage plans. Uh, getting getting a claim through, they're not just like Medicare. You have to get approvals. You have to um, you know got to call and get prior offs for a lot of things. I know other healthcare entities, smaller places that have actually had to hire people to do just that. I'm sure we've had to do that here. So there are some additional um, FTEs that you have to pay for to meet that need so that the Medicare Advantage plan can save some money. Have you really saved any money at that point? Uh, 
across the entire healthcare continuum? I would say no. Um, mm -hmm. There are other, when you think about all the reporting for quality, there's software involved, there are staff that you have to hire to analyze it all, all good work. But again, there's a cost. Um, you know, putting all this together, I will say I'm from New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look for your die. And uh and and we don't have this level of oversight in New Hampshire. And I, you know, I think about the hours that Andrew has put in and Wynn has put in. I'm new to the game. The team in general has put in to prepare all this. You know, there are costs involved with that. Um, whether they're good or bad doesn't really matter, but there are just are costs. So those okay. are the sorts of things that we just yeah. that we that we're thinking of. And there's just more and more reporting re required mm -hmm. and a lot of people ask for similar data but not the same data right. data sets that are different mm -hmm. um, where you know if everybody asked you know we could agree on the same data set would make a lot easier but right. especially you know we have to put the same amount of effort in this is a gross somewhat of an overstatement but as a critical access hospital we have to put together the same level of budget detail with a very small team mm -hmm. that UVM has to put in that has a huge team. Right. It would be like asking DH to do it. So mm -hmm. there is, it is a, it is a, you know, it's part of how we operate these days, but it is, it takes a lot. Mm -hmm. So, and in, in, in a lot of, a lot of organizations, a lot of government entities ask us for information, federal and other, and right. there's just a lot of reporting. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, in the contingency plan section of your narrative, um, you state that um, if rates are not approved, you'd be forced to cut services because, um, and again, I'll quote, um, we only provide what the community needs. And I'm, I'm wondering how you know that with such certainty. Well, we, we are actually just finishing up our community three year community needs assessment um, is just finishing up. So we'll have a better sense of what, um, you know, we'll have the community needs adjusted or changed or not. I mean, we do a lot of uh, community based work, a lot of which is grant funded, some of which is grant funded as well. Uh, but, you know, we we've, over time we've had we've made decisions of things that we are or are not going to do anymore. Um, you know, sometimes we have specialists that we um, underwrite to a certain degree. Um, is it is it worthwhile for us to provide that level of access at that cost? And as you know, specialists are expensive. Um, an example is we have a we have an interruption in our neurology service right now, uh, and we've brought in a, a locums to make sure that um, we continue that service not at the same level, but to make sure that our patients actually have access because they won't get access anywhere else, and they're depending on that continuum of care. In a different situation, we might say that we just can't afford to do that, which then goes completely against all the population health work we're doing to keep everybody healthy and in the right care milieu. So, you know, it's it's you know, it's just like your house budget. You only have so much that you can do with, with the with the revenue mm -hmm. that you, you know, the salary you have. So um, yeah. you know, luckily we've been able to, you know, we're conservative, um, but we're forward thinking. And so we try to figure out, you know, what we can afford to do and, and try to get creative just like everybody else uh, in this on this call to us every day. Um, mm -hmm. It is everyday decisions that we're making to try to make sure that we keep, you know, one of the things we have then is we have been stable. And um, despite our margin, and you know, we try really hard to, to keep that um, and deliver where we can. Luckily, we do have a partner in Dartmouth Health. Uh, that can, um, you know, depending on what the situation is, let it lend us some level of support, but even they are stressed uh, as well. Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunity with Valley mm -hmm. uh, that I think, you know, as we come into next year's, you know, when we're here next year, um, I think it'll be very interesting for us to see where we are in that process and what you, what we realize and what we foresee as opportunities to collaborate and, and lower the cost structure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think, I think, I think that that's with us will be very interesting. I'm looking forward to it. I, I did uh, look through the um, 2021 community needs assessment, um, and the, the top areas were mental health care, the affordability of care, care for patients with substance use disorders, the socioeconomic status factors affecting health and well being, dental care, um, and child abuse. Um, and neglect prevention. 
Um, and so as a regulator, it'd be, it'd be reassuring to me um, if I'm signing off on, a, on an overage above guidance to see that the overage was going toward community needs. And are there priorities, objectives, key performance indicators that align with those community needs? Um, and so I look forward to next year and, and um, hope that we'll see some more of that. And um, just close out again by um, just saying again that I really um, appreciate the, the high quality standards and the scores that you're receiving there. It's a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. This is Robin Lynch. I can go ahead and go next. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And I'm sorry about your tech problems. That sounds frustrating. Um, Actually, Robin, uh, you're the one person we can see. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Now my dog's barking. <laughs> um, the so uh, some of my questions have already been answered. So, but so I just have a couple. Um, I want thanks for outlining on slide 20 the sh the ex the expense savings you're expecting from the shared oversight and management with Dartmouth. Um, one question that I had, I know this is a work in progress, um, was sort of when you would expect those savings to hit the budget, what your assumptions are for them in uh, the 25 budget, and just give us a sense of timing for those savings. Well, for the budget, uh, we have a 0.5 FTE for CEO and a 0.5 FTE for CFO. So an immediate um, you know, savings of about a million dollars. And we are already sharing you know, our lab manager, our respiratory manager. Um, so that's baked into the budget as well. That's been ongoing for a, a few years. I'm not sure how long that's been going on. That's been built in for a while. Right. And then I did notice also on that slide that there were some supplies and other joint purchasing stuff that that had been ha we've heard about for several years. So appreciated um, that being listed as well. Um, uh, on uh, page slide, page five of your narrative, you mentioned your current recruitment for a pain clinic provider. What was your budget assumption related to that? position? Yeah, we did not include it in our budget because we didn't have them um, have anybody lined up. Okay. That would that, actually, Robin, going back, that would be an example of making a decision of whether or not to pay uh, a lot of, of locums money to provide right. that service. Um, and that service is missing in this region as well. I believe Springfield also lost, may have lost their provider as well. So it's a shortcoming, but you know, it's trying to find the right anesthesia person to do that service or physiatrist is challenging. It's a definitely a need in this community. Um, but again, we couldn't, we couldn't pull it off given the, the quotes we were given from some of the outside groups that provide this. Took all Thank took you. away. It, it wasn't prompt. It wasn't. It was. A, it was a huge loss to be able to do it that way. Well, thank you for the clarification. Sometimes it can be hard to to tell in the narrative exactly what's happening. So I appreciate that. Continue to pursue it. We continue to pursue it to yeah. bring it back online because it is important. So there's a, you know, and from our recruitment side, it's it's in our focus and and looking at niche providers. Great. Um. So. Uh, one in your narrative, you also discussed um, that you've had some increases budget to budget in pediatrics and primary care, 13% budget to budget for peds and 9% for primary care. I, I wondered if you could just speak a little bit more to how you came up to your estimates or is that because you currently have hired those providers? Just give us a little more sense of how that got built into the budget. So we hired two additional nurse pediatric nurse practitioners uh, on this campus, uh, on, the, on the hospital campus. Uh, and as we also foresee the, um, the, the slowing down of one of our, our pediatricians as she nears retirement. Uh, and so that is where you see a piece of, a piece of that uh, increase there. We, 
I will say one of the, and that has allowed us to be one of the places we have ready access where there is no wait is actually outpatient pediatrics. Uh, and so we have that, and we do a lot of work, as you're probably aware, with the schools. Um, you know, we have a physician liaison, Dr. Mary Bender, uh, for the Windsor schools, and Dr. Claire Grabenko for the Woodstock schools. So we're very closely with our schools around that. So we do have capacity there, but it was also in preparation uh, for a transition, trying to avoid what's happening in other areas where all of a sudden you have an absence. Right. And in primary care, in FY24 budget, we had new providers starting. We had a ramp up factor. Now in 25, they're fully ramped up and rock and roll. And right. the other piece is obviously as we look at you know the MGMA, um, you know, what physicians and providers are being paid and being able to, to stay market competitive yeah. uh, so that we keep our providers, we had we really had to, and we had for a couple of years still been delayed in our, our what we were our increases had to do some catch up work. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just check my notes here. Oh, one more. Okay, I think that was it for me. I think everything else I have on my list is answered. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. It's nice to see you. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me, but I was going to go next. This is Jessica Holmes. Are you able to see me? No, but you, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay, perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for the presentation. And again, I'll echo my colleagues with uh, congratulations on a lot of the quality achievements um, and the new accreditation for the outpatient rehab therapy. That's impressive. And I can imagine that was a lot of hard work. Um, I have some questions that I just, I think they're just clarifying questions that I need to understand about the rate, um, the request. So from my understanding, uh, it's a 3.5% charge increase. Uh, can you just describe how that uh, balances out across inpatient, outpatient, and professional? Yeah, it's uh, be applied. Yeah. yeah, for inpatient and outpatient across all provider clinics, uh, across all inpatient uh, services, uh, ancillaries, it's 3.5 across the board, except for pharmacy, actually, that's, we have a markup policy, uh, cost plus, uh, so it's, we're not applying it to pharmacy. Okay. Else. And professional, too, so across inpatient, outpatient, professional. Well, professional, inpatient, outpatient, yep. Okay. Um, and in the narrative, it described that it was uh, 3.0 was what was needed, but the 0.5 was uh, related to the CON project. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, assuming that that gets approved. So if I um, so that would be in the charge request, assuming that that gets approved. Aside from the 0.5 increase in the charge, uh, related to the CON, is there any place else in the budget that um, we would see the approved uh, CON project? For example, on the revenue side, is there any projected increase in revenue cycle management um, performance that might increase revenue? Or are there any cost savings on the expense side that you've booked into the budget related to the CON project? We've tried to align our budget as, uh, as best as I could uh, with the CON application. Um, there, the first phase is the ERP, so administrative, and uh, there's actually the operational expenses that are in the budget that relate to um, implementing the project. So, um, mostly expenses. Okay, so there's no estimated revenue improvement related to revenue cycle improvements, fewer claims than anything on that on that regard. That's, 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 yeah, that, yeah. that's with the ER, uh, the EHR. The okay, that will all come with the EHR. So there's nothing that you're expecting in terms of, uh, it's only operational expenses that are added, no cost savings. I thought you in your description, you were very excited about this, talking about the upside potential of this. So I was I was wondering where it might we might see it in the budget. 
Yes, I am excited. Um, <laughs> I believe you, um, but I'm just trying to figure out where, where the excitement might land in the budget. Um, we haven't quite figured out the details of who's going where. Um, so it's, we're kind of level budgeted right now. Okay. So in the budget, we have only costs associated with the CON if it's approved. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, was say, I think also when you're thinking about sort of revenue cycle, um, if you've heard from some of your, if you've heard from other hospitals who have done EMR implementations, it's not always an instantaneous um, improvement. There is there are usually months of cleaning up things, despite the fact that we're not the first uh, to go live with DH uh, on on our our ERP. You know, there there takes time to to fine tune those projects. So to I think we'll see better revenue cycle work, especially when we bring Conifer in as part of that. And we might see something toward the end of the, you know, end of the fiscal year, but I think it would be, we'd be naive to say that right out of the gate, we're gonna see savings given the fact that it's it's our revenue cycle. I actually did, for, I forgot something, I'm remembering something now. Part of our shared service uh, credit allocation is uh, or includes uh, like a rebate on the finance piece. So for AP and GL mm -hmm. and bankruptcy and stuff, I think it's about 140 grand in FTE costs. Yeah, well, yeah. in the yeah. shared service yeah. credit because yeah. of uh, the ERP phase one. Okay. Oh, just there there is there. some, but sorry. And I just wanted, just that I have a, a more of an apples to apples understanding of the charge and the the impact underneath the charge across payers. And I know you had a slide up there, but I actually was just gonna ask you some more specific questions about um, assumptions here. So uh, can you just tell me what rate increase you assumed for Medicaid Vermont? We have 1% as the net impact. I mean, it's 3.5 across all payers, the gross uh, price, and we typically see 27% reimbursement um, or payment rates from Medicaid. So baked into our budget is about a 1% increase. Yeah, I'm trying to unpack um, a little bit about what you're assuming for Vermont Medicaid versus what you're assuming for New Hampshire Medicaid. So if you can, maybe we can follow up with me. I, this seems like a blended Medicaid from historical performance. Um, in the in the narrative, it said you have no indication of what Medicaid reimbursement will be at this time, although we are hearing that there are no increases budgeted. So I'm trying to understand what the assumptions are in the budget according to, you know, Medicaid rate increases from Vermont, Medicaid rate increases from New Hampshire to get at that, what I, I'm perceiving as a blended rate, but it sounds like off historical, you know. Yeah, we, draw, we so. don't have the most accurate uh, pinpoint for every payer. We do kind of big number, big picture estimates uh, using a reimbursement and revenue model that we've used over many years. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close, you know. Um, well, it's a math model. Yeah. It's a, it's a math model. The reality of it may be that you, you don't get that 1%. Yeah. yeah. Historically, it's brought us in right about where we expect mm -hmm. to be, though, yeah. as you've noted. Okay. So you're not actually, it doesn't sound like you're actually using actual rate increases um, as described by Medicaid. You're using this model. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any assumption in there under what you're assuming for Medicare Advantage increases in rate? They're lumped in um, with Medicare and they pay Medicare rates uh, unsettled Medicare cost report rates. So like they'll pay the interim payment rate um, from a previously filed cost report or per diems for inpatient uh, mm -hmm. acute or swing. So um, yeah. just kind of follows the Medicare Medicare bucket. Okay, so would yeah. the assumption be what the Medicare market basket increase is or is there a different assumption? Medicare pays based on cost. So as our costs go up, our Medicare rate goes up. Even for Medicare Advantage. I guess that's what I'm trying to yeah. identify yeah. the yeah. difference between the Medicare Advantage. And I understand for a critical access hospital, the cost-based reimbursement for traditional. I'm trying to understand the assumption that you're making about Medicare Advantage. 
Yeah. Medicare Advantage programs typically will contract with critical access hospitals to pay um, either either the Medicare rate or maybe a little bit above because they don't cost settle. Okay. They, they pay that, so they'll use the letter that Medicare sends us saying, "Here's your new, here's your new outpatient payment rate, and here's your inpatient payment rate," and they'll okay. use those exact numbers. Yeah. So they, there's okay. always a lot. Yeah. Got it. Okay, I understand. Um, interesting. Okay. Um, and I guess my, my last question is related to, I'm just trying to understand, trying to reconcile a little bit of what I've heard and read, um, in the narrative. Um, there was some discussion earlier about, uh, maybe the relative prices being high because, compared to other hospitals in the area because volumes are low. Um, and then there was discussion about, you know, having to cover the fixed costs with lower volumes than other potential uh, hospitals in the area. Um, and I also heard and saw, you know, the access challenges that your community faces and could see in the, uh, the submission, the long visit lags, and actually you showed some of that data. Um, and we heard about, uh, primary care being closed to new patients, and so I, I'm 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 trying to reconcile the relative the, the description about somewhat low volumes, harder to cover fixed costs, access challenges, and then the productivity uh, that does seem to be at or below 25th percentile in the submission. So, wondering how that all, if you could help me understand that set of of information. That's a lot to unpack. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can unpack part of the suitcase for you. Um, so we have had a loss of some providers and we've had some false starts, as you've probably heard from other hospitals. You know, you bring someone in and then they, they don't stick and they don't stay. So you've got access issues. Um, we believe that in um, in working with our, especially our primary care provide our primary care leaders that we will be opening back up to patients starting in September, given our the, the, the new providers that are starting with us. Um, we have been working with our providers around productivity. Um, you know, historically, they are largely hover in and around the 25th percentile. Um, none of them are actually on an incentive plan like you would see in some other hospitals. Our physicians and providers um, that's the way they practice, and trying to move them is is um, is a is a concerted yet thoughtful effort in doing that. And we have been made some strides in changing um, schedule templates and and opening some things up uh, to to absorb. And I, we, I will say, when we take new patients, if someone comes to work for us, is a new employee and moves to the region and needs a primary care provider. We do take them. If you are a pediatric patient who is maturing and needs an adult provider, we will take we, we will take you into the practice and figure out how to do that. So when we say we're closed, we are closed for for pieces of it, but there is there are some access issues there. So it's it's a balancing act, um, and we're trying to um, from a productivity perspective work our way there, and um, we expect. On average, our providers will be above the 25th percentile coming into September is the, um, the RBU data that we're looking at right now. Uh, and so that's our target is to, to continually move us toward the median. Uh, but it's, and it is something about Vermont. I don't, you know, there is a, there is a practice pattern. There is an expectation of how much time you're gonna spend with your patients. The challenge of the EMR that we have right now uh, I will tell you that you know a lot of uh, uh, places when they put in a new EMR uh, providers in particular say, "Oh, what was me?" But they've all worked in Epic and they can't wait to get rid of the friction uh, that happens in the system when they work with their DH colleagues and they're in disparate systems. So I think you'll see some of that um, through concerted effort and evolution incrementally change, but there is not going to be an overnight flip of the switch. Okay, and, but your goal is to move to the median, it sounds like, across all this, the specialties? Over time, yes. 
Do you have a time on that? What is what is the expectation for 25, fiscal year 25? Is to be somewhere between the 25th and the 30th percentile on average. Okay. And that's what's assumed in the budget? Yes, say. yes, I would say that is fair to say. Um, let me just see if I have any other questions. Oh, just one question about the, the access. I noted the referral times. There was not a lot of data on how long it takes to uh, schedule a patient, and I was just wondering if that was why that was. Well, it's a two-week period, and um, depending on the service line or if it's like uh, the radiology, you know, really dependent on who walks in the door. Um, can you can you clarify that again? I don't know. If sure. I quite yeah, no, no problem. I just was noticing, so on the referral lags, for example, um, for all primary care, there were the total number of patients was zero, and the percentage of appointments scheduled within three business days of referral was also zero. And then, but then below for the visit lags, there were 57 uh, total number of new patients, and then there was, you know, the, the lag time associated with the, the scheduling, so, or, or with the visit. So I was trying to figure out there were 57 new patients that came in during that time period, but in the referral at, uh, table, it said zero, and then there was zero scheduled. So I was trying to understand if you're, you know, what, what the submission was there and why there wasn't uh, referral information. Does that make more that. sense? It does. I, I, yeah. I can't answer it. Some of that might be that it's your, the pediatrics are lumped in there and that that's a piece of it. But why don't we, I, that might be something we need to clarify okay. and get back to you on. Yeah, and I just, you know, I guess what I would just say is that'd be helpful. And then just for next year, it is important for us to understand, you know, some of this access. This is our way of getting a sense of access. And so referral lags, uh, as well as visit lags are important components of that. Yeah, no, they're, so. important, they're important to us. And as we, I think uh, Dr. Ip noted earlier, Dartmouth has a system-wide goal of 14 days or less for any any specialty, and you know, as we move forward, so that's laudable. Know. I I hope we all make it. <laughs> I hope that happens. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I have family oh. members that give me a hard time that it's taking a long time to get in. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I I think we all struggle yeah. on both ends of our jobs. I get it. Um, yes. Okay, that I think those are all of my questions. I appreciate your time and answering them. Thank you. Happy to. Thank you. Anything from the healthcare advocate? Yeah, good afternoon. I don't know if folks can hear me. I know we're short on time. Um, so I just wanted to ask one question. Uh, I want to thank folks for um, your focus on bad debt and free care in your presentation and your work with our office on Act 119. Um, I did want to just ask about tangible steps you're going to take to reduce your bad debt to free care ratio. I mean, I think you're aware your ratio is, is not where you want it to be. Um, and from looking at your audited financials, it looks like you provided financial assistance to fewer people last year than you did in 2022. So I just was wanted to ask about the the steps you're going to take to to realize the the budgeted difference. Thanks. I mean, I don't I don't know an awful lot. I bear with me because I'm fairly new here, but I have had several meetings about the Act 119 uh, task force that that Nana Scutney has put together. And it's made up of um, a largely the frontline managers and they've done quite a bit of work on making sure that the applications are more accessible, that they're out, they really, really revamped um, our efforts and they're meeting on a fairly regular basis to push it out. Uh, I think probably we would have to get you more details on specifics that they're doing, but I do know they've taken it very seriously and, and are, and are working through on it. Um, we can get some sort of a summary of some of the steps they're taking, if you would like. Sure, no, that'd be great. And I know you've been in touch with their office. I just wanted to ask um, in the hearing oh, okay. context too. Yeah. Okay. No, thank you. That's all. That's all for me. I think I'll, I'll ask right now. Back to you. Thanks, all right. Thank you all for your presentation and your time today. Um, that's all we have. Uh, we'll have public comment at the end of the day. Um, you don't need to be here for that if you don't want to be. 
Uh, thanks for the presentation, and we will go off the record and adjourn until 12.15.